what will heaven be like? It's a question that has captured the human imagination for as long as there has been a human imagination. It's also a question that Jesus spent quite a lot of time trying to answer, particularly with his parables. Remember, so many of Jesus' parables begin with, the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. He spends a lot of time trying to explain what heaven is like. And the parable that's in the scripture I'm about to read this morning is particularly surprising because it shows us that one thing heaven will not be is fair. Let us pray. Holy God, as always, we give you thanks for your word to us in Scripture. And we pray that you would take this word, and plant it deeply within our hearts today, and cause it to grow and bear good fruit for the sake of your kingdom. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same, and about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. And he replied to one of them, <coughs> Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first. And the first last. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Our society values fairness. We like it when things are fair, don't we? When things work out the way they are supposed to work out. When, when good things happen to good people and bad things, if they happen at all, only happen to bad people. Right? We, we think good students should get into the school or the college that they want. People who work hard should be able to get decent paying jobs and good promotions. Criminals should be punished for breaking the law. People who drive slowly in the fast lane should have their licenses revoked. Yeah. <laughs> you all agree with yes. I have no personal agenda here. We want things to be fair in our own lives and the world around us, and it seems to be a universal human value. I mean, we may each define fairness in a given situation a little bit differently, and some cultures may consider some things fair or unfair a little bit differently, but we all carry with us a sense of fair and unfair, and when that sense is violated, we all feel that a great wrong has been done. Our society, indeed our whole human race, values fairness. And this is what makes Jesus' parable here so shocking. This story suggests that while our society values fairness, the kingdom of God values grace. Jesus begins this parable by saying that the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house. So right away, we know the master is the main focus of this story. And Jesus is trying to tell us what heaven is going to be like. 
It's like a master of a house. This master goes out early in the morning to hire some laborers for his vineyard. It's probably harvest time, and he needs some extra help. So he goes to the part of the city where all the unemployed <coughs> gather day after day, looking to be hired for a day's wage. This was a common practice, still is, in many places in the world, not to mention here. There are plenty of places where people go to certain spots to look for work for the day because they don't have a steady job. This master knows where to go. He goes to the part of town where the unemployed gather. He makes a contract with several of, several of the workers. He says, okay, let's make an arrangement. I'll pay you a denarius, which was the standard daily wage at the time. And everybody agrees to it. And so he takes them and they go and work on his vineyard. Then he comes back after a few hours and sees the group still standing there. And he hires some more <coughs> laborers to come and work for his vineyard. He doesn't work out an official contract. He says, I'll pay you whatever's right. And then he comes back again and again and again. Five times, right up to the very end of the day, the master continued giving work to the unemployed. This was not an, an issue of the master not knowing how to count, or not knowing how much work he needed. Like, oh, I didn't hire enough, now, now I realize my mistake, I need to go hire some more. No, he knows what he's doing. He could have just hired all the workers that he needed the first time, and he probably did. But he couldn't get that picture out of his head of all the others standing there waiting for work. So he comes back to see, did you guys find other work today? And they didn't. So he says, well, let me hire a few more of you. And it still bugs him. So it goes back again. Some of you still didn't find work? Well, come and work for me. And then he does it again and again. He continues giving work to the unemployed because he has compassion on these poor, humiliated young men who have to stand there in public announcing to the world, I don't have a job. And they wait there waiting for work. He says, I'm going to give you some work. He kept coming back to see if they found jobs, and when they hadn't, he gave them work even when he didn't have to. That is called grace. And Jesus said, it's what the kingdom of heaven is like. But here's the thing about grace. It is not fair. Grace is God's unearned and undeserved <coughs> favor in our life. Unearned and undeserved, which means that by definition, grace is unfair. Fairness is about getting what we deserve. Trust me, when it comes to God, the last thing any of us want is what we deserve. <laughs> and that's why grace is not fair. In the parable, at the very end of the day, the master tells his foreman, he has a foreman, he could have sent the foreman to go and hire these guys, he didn't, he did it himself. Again, compassion and the grace. He tells his foreman, go gather the workers together and start paying them, but pay them from the most recently hired to the first that were hired. The foreman paid the men who worked only one hour, very end of the day, a full denarius, a full day's wage. And all the other workers are standing around watching this, amazed at his generosity. And then he hires the workers that work for three hours, and then six hours, and then nine hours. He gives them all the same amount, a denarius. And now the first workers who have a contract are thinking, well, we agreed to a denarius, but Clearly, we're going to get paid more because we spent the entire day working. As the parable said, they expected to get more, and they should have expected to get more. As the story says, each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, in so many words, that's not fair. And they were right. It wasn't. Because grace isn't fair, grace is generous. There's a scene that I want to show you from the musical Les Miserables. Some of you have seen it before, maybe even seen the rendition. It, it perfectly illustrates the fact that grace is not fair, it is exceedingly generous. 
So hopefully we've got it ready to show on the screen. Don't worry if you don't follow along with every single word. Again, it's a musical, so a lot of it is sung. It'll be easy to catch the gist of what's going on in the scenes. So Dan, go ahead and cue it up and see if it works. Suffered while weary, and the night is cold out here. Oh, our lives are very humble, but we have, we have to share. There is wine here to revive you, there is bread to make you strong. Bed to rest till morning, rest from pain and rest from wrong. Bless the food we eat today, bless our dear sister and our old guest. Went underpaid. 
They were angry because some seemed overpaid, but nobody was underpaid. Grace is more than fair. I've got another little thing to show you. I couldn't help myself. How many of you have read Talvin Hobbes, the comic, when it was around and have some of their books? If you haven't, you need to pick up one of the books. It's just the best comic ever made. But there's, there's a Calvin Hobbes comic. Go ahead and show it if it's on the screen there. So Calvin, Calvin comes in. This is only two scenes out of the full thing. Calvin complains to his parents, why do you guys get to stay up late and I have to go to bed early? It's not fair, he yells. And Calvin's dad says, the world isn't fair, Calvin. He stamps off and says, I know. Well, why isn't it ever unfair in my favor? <laughs> My friends, God's grace is unfair in our favor. It's unfair because we receive more than we have earned and more than we deserve. And we see the fruits of this in our lives, don't we? I mean, I mean, how many of us have at some point, if not regularly, benefited from some unfair generosity, either directly on God's part or through people that we know and love in our lives. It could be a teacher in school who paid more attention to you than she needed to, to help you with your homework. It could be, it could be a coach. This is what Fellowship of Christian Athletes is all about. It could be a coach that gave you more opportunities, not just on the field, but in life, than they had to. It could be a financial bonus you didn't earn, a promotion that your boss took a risk giving you. It could be a good biopsy result when the person next to you got a bad result. How much of our lives is unfair generosity that we neither earn nor deserve? I imagine it's far more than most of us usually admit. We have received grace upon grace. And it is wonderfully unfair. Now, of course, not everybody thinks this is wonderful, that grace is so unfair. The unfairness of grace can easily make it look to some like it is nothing more than a handout. God stepping in and, and just giving someone a handout free of charge, cheap grace it's sometimes called. The Apostle Paul was criticized for this when he went around preaching to everybody, all you need to do is believe in Christ, you don't need to follow the Old Testament Jewish laws anymore, you just need to believe in Christ. Some people said, wait a second, that's cheap grace. It's going to lead some people to be lazy and not work for God, not dedicate their lives to God. What's the role of works in this? Isn't that the risk we take with cheap grace? Well, it's interesting that Paul actually argued that, that grace results in more good works for God and not less because grace transforms us. This is the classic Reformed understanding of grace, which is that grace results in works without requiring works. It results in works without requiring works. The workers in the parable, they were hired out of pure grace. That's where the grace begins, when they were hired in the first place. And what happens after that? Good work for the day. If the master of the house just wanted to give these guys food to put on their table, he could have gone out at the 11th hour and said, you guys are still standing here? I feel bad about that. Here's a denarius. Take it, go home, buy some food. He could have just given them a handout. But instead, he gave them work to do. He gave them dignity. He gave them the ability to go home to their, their wives and their children and say, I found work today. And that's why I can put food on this table. The master didn't settle for a handout. He gave them dignity. He gave them grace. And it resulted in good work for them to do. Grace is not a handout. It is still closely related to good works. It's just not in the direction we thought. When grace has been truly received, it always results in good work. And this means that we have no right to complain about the grace that God chooses to give to other people. There is no injustice in the way that God doles out grace. When the first workers complain, the master gives them a stern warning at the end of the parable. He says, friend, I am doing you no wrong. 
Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do that? Am I not allowed to do as I please with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Take what belongs to you. The grace of God already belongs to you and to me. You have received God's full payment of grace through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which means that you already have everything God could possibly give. And that's because this is the way grace works. Grace is all or nothing. You can't divvy up grace into, you get this much grace or this percentage of grace. Grace is an all or nothing package. That's the way that it works. God doesn't just give out part of it. He always gives all of it. And that's why the last workers were paid a full denarius. They were given full payment. Because when it comes to grace, that's the only option. It's nothing or it's full payment. The master said, I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. In other words, the same thing that I gave to you, it's the same amount. It doesn't matter whether a person receives God's grace as a child and then lives their whole life, lives a good life for God, or whether someone receives Christ on their deathbed after living a bad life. The same amount of grace is required for both. The same amount of grace is required for the worst of sinners and for the very best of saints. Grace is all or nothing, and you already have all of it. How could we be jealous when God is generous with someone else? We already have everything God has to give. So the final question is, will you begrudge or will you be grateful? The parable stops before it ends. We don't get to see the ending. How did those first workers respond? they throw their money back and get angry and walk away? Do they learn their lesson? We don't know. Because as with most of Jesus' parables, we are the ones who finish the story. We are the ones who are left deciding how to respond. The end is there for us to finish. And so will we begrudge the grace of God? Or will we be grateful that we have all received our unfair share? I think the choice is fairly clear. May God help us to make the right one. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.